Brian Brook lecture, the Brian Brook Medal, is awarded by this association to um, an individual um, who's made an outstanding contribution um, to colorectal care. And I say that in its widest role, surgery, stoma care, um, research, peristomal dermatology, anything of relevance to the subject matter that Brian Brook, who of course was the founder of this association, had dear to his heart. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me today to be able to welcome um, a colleague and friend uh, and possibly notionally a previous just about trainee, actually, uh, Professor David Jane, uh, who's Professor of Surgery at the University of Leeds. Uh, David uh, qualified from the University of Wales, Cardiff, in 1989, and he then undertook a period of postgraduate training in Greater Manchester, which is where I met him. And I think he was a very young trainee in about 1996, just as I was about to become a consult consultant. Um, and despite that, we didn't put him off. Um, and he went to Leeds, where he undertook an MD and became lecturer in surgery. He had a fellowship in Singapore. And he then returned to become a senior lecturer in Leeds in 2002. And at that time, he ran what I think is still probably regarded as one of this country's most important colorectal surgical trials. That was the classic trial uh, in laparoscopic colorectal surgery uh, with um, the then professor of surgery, Pierre Guillou. But I understand that David actually did all the work. Pierre did all the traveling and talking about it. Uh, and this was a huge trial because it really changed the way, it was a, literally a game changer in the way colorectal surgery was undertaken in this country to embrace minimally invasive surgery. David's been chair of surgery in Leeds in two, since 2011. He's had a NIHR research professorship since 2012 to 2017, a Bowel Cancer UK research chair at the Royal College of Surgeons of England, and he's been heavily involved in NHS innovation work to try and incorporate and innovate technology in, in our working lives for the benefits of our patients. I know he's going to give a wonderful talk today because I've heard David many times. And uh, David, you're more than welcome and thank you for uh, talking today. So th thank you for that introduction, uh, Gordon, and thank you very much to the uh, organising committee. This is a real uh, honour. Um, it came completely out of the blue when uh, Gordon um, got in touch and invited me and it's a real pleasure to come down here and speak to you today. So I'm uh, a colorectal surgeon. I, I work in uh, Leeds. In Leeds we have two hospitals. We have the old site, the General Infirmary at Leeds, and then we have another site um, called St. James's, which is, has all the, the modern uh, St. James's Oncology uh, Institute. And we're particularly proud of our colorectal heritage because of this uh, gentleman here. This is uh, Professor John Golliger. And he was probably uh, the father of modern colorectal surgery. And he wrote um, seminal textbooks that we all uh, learned from, but he was also uh, a great innovator and uh, he pioneered many um, new aspects in colorectal surgery. For example, um, the circular stapler that has become part of our routine care. So we, we have a, a sort of pedigree uh, for innovation uh, in the city. As Gordon said, I moved from Manchester, where I, you know, I still bear the whip marks from uh, Gordon and his colleagues, but I survived and, and got out and got, got over the other end side of the Pennines in 1996. And at that stage, this was how we did surgery. It was all big cuts. So you opened the abdomen up from the top to the bottom, you did what you needed to do, and then you closed it all back up. But big cuts come with big problems. There's pain and all the complications from that. The wounds are big, so there's an increased chance that they can get infected. If they get infected, they don't heal properly, and you can develop hernias, etc. And at that stage, when I moved to Leeds, 
uh, laparoscopic keyhole surgery was just really uh, in its infancy. And we were starting off um, this big trial to see uh, whether it was of any benefit and whether it was uh, safe or not. So instead of doing big cuts, we were doing everything through tiny keyholes. The surgery inside was the same, or essentially the same. It was just the way we accessed the abdomen. And this really um, threatened to revolutionize how we did our operations. So we conducted a big uh, randomized controlled trial to try and work out the benefits or otherwise of keyhole surgery against standard open surgery. And you can see in this graph here, the top two lines, the red line and the dotted blue line. One of those is the open cut and one is the keyhole. And there really wasn't much difference between them. Now this trial goes back a long time and the technology we were using at that time is very, very different from what it is today. But we did see some areas where we could improve. So the conversion rates back in those days, and by conversion I mean going, we can't do it with keyholes, so we need an open cut, they were really very high. One in four patients with colon surgery, and even higher, a third of patients with rectal cancer, you just couldn't, we couldn't do at that time with keyhole surgery. So there was clearly room for improvement. And likewise, in the, this was a cancer study, some of the cancer outcomes were perhaps not as good as they could have been. This is where the robot uh, then came in. So the, the robot was actually uh, first launched a long time ago, 1999. But it's gone through several quite dramatic uh, iterations and technological advancements between then um, and now up to the current form, the Da Vinci XI, which we uh, routinely use. And potentially this much uh, better technical innovation could help us to overcome some of those difficulties that we saw in the classic study. So we wanted to try and find out about this and uh, we, oh, that's the, <laughs> that's the wrong slide. So we devised uh, um, another randomized control trial. This time it was called the ROLAR trial. And what it looked at was keyhole surgery against robotic surgery. And again, we were trying to see whether the robot really gave us an advantage. And what we saw was that using the robot did help us to reduce those conversion rates. So we could actually complete keyhole surgery more often with the robot than we could with keyhole surgery. It was safe, so in terms of complications and cancer outcomes, they were equivalent between the two groups. And not surprisingly, we didn't actually see any difference in quality of life or what we call functional outcomes, because essentially the operation we were doing, whether it was keyhole or with the robot, was the same. But robots are expensive, and that's been one of the, the big issues with their wider deployment. So the robot costs around a thousand pounds, roughly, more per operation than keyhole surgery. And the reasons for that are mainly because the operations take longer to do with the robot, and also the robotic instruments uh, are more expensive. So again, we've, we've seen this stepwise improvement, but there are still areas that we can improve further on, particularly around the costs. We continued our robotic work, and I, I put this in because this is something that I think is potentially, um, could offer very real benefits. I'm sure many in the audience have had a colonoscopy, and it's not a particularly pleasant experience. So to have a colonoscopy, the endoscopist has to push the endoscope around a metre and a half of colon. And what this robot does, this is a uh, robotic magnetic robot, so the end of the colonoscope has a magnet, 
and we use a robot to gently pull that magnet and the endoscope around the colon. And because it's all digital, you can bring in all the fancy AI stuff. So the robot will recognize the center, the lumen, the center of the bowel, the green dot, and it will automatically home in on it and just follow it around. So we are making huge progress with robotics in many areas of surgery. One of my first forays into um, innovation, uh, really, was some funding we got in uh, 2012. And this was from NIHR, which I'm sure you know is the, the research arm uh, of the NHS. And they funded us for five years, um, essentially, um, to work with innovators, with industry, academia, patients and public, to try and find the most innovative technologies and to try and pull those, accelerate the pull uh, into the NHS. And back in those days, this is 10 years ago uh, now, uh, one of the people we worked with uh, was this chap called Michael Sears. I suspect many people in the audience might have come across Michael. He was a very ca uh, charismatic uh, and dynamic chap. Michael had Crohn's disease, but he had it very bad, and he ended up having a small bowel uh, transplant, uh, transplantation. Um, one day, whilst he was recovering from his transplantation, he was playing with his Wii. And you have a Wii glove on, and as you bend your fingers or move your arm, whatever you do with your fingers is translated uh, onto the actual screen. And it dawned on him that the transducer in the glove of his Wii uh, device, why couldn't he use that to measure the filling and emptying of a stoma bag? And that's what he did. He built this... A uh, transducer which you could put onto a, uh, an ileostomy bag and it measured when the bag was getting full and it would uh, uh, alert. Sadly, uh, Michael passed away uh, a couple of years ago and I've kind of lost track of, of what's happened to the company. So we were lucky enough to get that infrastructure funding uh, renewed. So we worked for five years in colorectal and then the subsequent five years, and we're coming to the end of this round of funding, we've been working more broadly across other, other uh, surgical disciplines. So we work in vascular surgery, uh, hepatobiliary, emergency general surgery now. And this is the network we, we currently run. So there's 11 of these uh, cooperatives around the UK. Again, bringing together lots of different stakeholders to really... Um, try and get innovation in the NHS for the patient, for the benefit of patients. And you can see I've, I've picked my examples here for things that I thought might be interesting uh, to the audience. So in, as part of this cooperative, we've been working with this company called Ostomy Cure. And what they have is a, a device called the TIES device. And this is a titanium implant with a lid on it. And people will be familiar with the old cock pouch. So this was a valve pouch that underneath the, the skin, the pouch accumulated uh, the uh, enteric contents, and then you could intubate it when convenient to empty the pouch. And so the theory behind this cap, really, is it produces an obstruction which allows the bowel underneath to dilate up and in effect forms a bit of a reservoir. So it's a very simple innovation. It's very easy um, to put in. The patient wears the cap during the day. There is a special device you can put on it. You empty it, you then put uh, the cap on. So you're completely um, continent. It's been evaluated um, in an international study um, there's 20 sites across the world, uh, and the aim was um, to recruit 200 patients. This study has now stopped because they couldn't recruit adequately to it. And we, although it sounds like a, a great idea, we, we have had problems with it. So in Leeds, we put four of these devices in, and sadly, 
we've had to take three of them out. I only have one patient still with the device uh, implanted. So clearly there, there are problems with this. It's not the panacea that perhaps it was thought to be, but maybe with some more innovation, it, it could be taken further. We've done quite a lot of work over the years on faecal incontinence. So a major healthcare burden, anywhere between 3 and 8% of the population experiencing uh, some degree uh, of incontinence. Obviously, it's a problem that gets older with age, and it's the second commonest cause of admission uh, to a nursing home. And it has a, a huge impact, not just on physical well-being, but also social, mental health as well. So it, it's really um, uh, an unrepresented uh, clinical need. We came across this company, they were called Torax, and what they had was uh, a continence restoration device, they called it. Essentially what it was was a string of magnetic beads, titanium beads, and you implanted these around the sphincter muscle, and the magnets would attract each other and help to close the anal canal. And then when you wanted to defecate, you pushed, it pushed the magnets apart, you passed the stool, and the magnets came back together again to help restore continence. And we set up a big study for this. It was funded again through NIHR. And we compared how this device worked with what was the gold standard of, at that time. And that was something called sacral nerve neuromodulation. So it was a randomized trial. And we needed 350 patients um, to complete the study. And things were going reasonably well. Um, we got to almost 100 patients, um, and things were looking good. And then Ethicon, one of the big boys, decided that they would buy out the smaller company. And that happened in February 2017. Ethicon decided that they no longer wanted to use this device for fecal incontinence. They wanted to use it for gastroesophageal reflux, and so they shelved it. And with doing that, they shelved our study as well. So that, that was very disappointing to all of us because I, I think this device may have actually had um, some sort of um, uh, potential. We've done uh, a lot of work and we've still got a, an ongoing program uh, around uh, an astomotic leak. I suspect the audience are quite familiar with what an astomotic leak is. It's essentially when you join two pieces of the bowel together it's like plumbing, the two ends have got to heal, and they've got to heal without leaking. And despite our best efforts over the past 30, 40 years, we really haven't made any impact on how often an astomotic leak occurs. And it's a, a significant event when it does occur. Patients become very sick uh, very quickly. And a poor proportion of them will not, will not survive. For some who do survive, there are also long-term uh, implications of, of that leak. And along with this, it's a significant uh, cost in terms of remedial treatment, time spent on critical care, intensive care, etc. And we really have to do something that impacts uh, on this uh, big problem. So we became interested in fluorescent imaging, fluorescent surgery. And there was a drug called indocyanin green that had been used in medicine for 50 years. It was very, very safe. And what it does, if you inject it in the bloodstream, it stays, more or less, stays in the bloodstream. And so it gives you a very nice uh, picture of the blood supply to any organ. But in our case, we're interested uh, in the bowel. So when we do bowel surgery, this is done uh, with the keyhole technique, we mobilize up the bowel, the anaesthetist gives the drug and we can watch this bowel becoming green and that's essentially what that's showing us is the blood supply. If it goes green it's got a good blood supply, if it doesn't then we've got a problem. And we can also look inside the bowel with an endoscope. So we, when we do a join, which you can see is the ring just about there, we can check 
that it's green on both sides of the anastomosis. And we can be confident that if it's got a good blood supply, then hopefully it should heal. When this was first used, um, the very first report of it being used caused uh, something of a sensation. Now, you might recall that in a previous slide, I said that um, you know, leak rates could be uh, around 10, 15%. And what this group reported was a leak rate of 1.4%. Now, that was a massive difference. It wasn't just a bit. It was transformative, if it was true. But there were problems with this study. So we had to find out more about it. And we set up yet another big uh, clinical trial called the INTACT study. And this was to try and see whether that massive difference that had been reported was in fact true or not. So half the operations we do, we do in normal keyhole with the white light. And the other half of the operations, we give the indocyne in green and the fluorescence. And that way we can see what the benefits of the fluorescence might be. And we're interested in seeing whether using the fluorescence we could actually decrease uh, the anastomotic leak rate, whether it changed the way that we did things during surgery, whether it changed stoma rates, because if we do a low anastomosis, or we're not sure about the anastomosis, we would protect it with a stoma. And it might be if we had more confidence in the anastomosis, we wouldn't have to do as many defunctioning uh, ileostomies. It's a very simple study design. It is in rectal cancer because it's in rectal cancer where the leak rates are highest. So it's an easier population for us to study. But essentially patients are randomized equally into one group or the other. And then we follow them up and we look particularly for an asthmatic leak, but also all sorts of other uh, complications. And they have a special test. They have a contrast test around six weeks following the operation so that we can be really confident. We're not guessing about whether they've had a leak or not. And we collect quality of life data, uh, etc. So this study is almost finished, I'm glad to say. It's taken the best part of six years. Um, Initially, uh, we needed 880 patients um, to to have confidence that the results uh, were robust. We did an interim analysis at 560 patients, and the Ethics Committee came back to us and said, well, actually, we'd like you to reduce the total number of patients, suggesting that they were seeing quite a big difference and that we didn't need to go on and recruit quite so many patients. So we're fairly confident about that. We're currently, currently at just over 720 patients, I think. So we've only got 40, 50 patients to do. So we're very excited that we're going to uh, get some results from this uh, fairly soon. Now, I've talked about the blood supply being important to get two bits of bowel um, to heal. But it's, although blood supply is important, it, it's not the whole of the st- story. There are still those joints in the bowel that have a good blood supply, but they will still leak. So there must be other factors uh, involved. And what people are interested in, in, and increasingly interested in, is the microbiomes, the bugs inside the bowel, and whether these bugs can actually infect the anastomosis and cause it uh, to break down. So we incorporated this into our study. And what we did, we collected the bugs from the bowel before the operation, at the time of the operation, and after the operation, at about the time when leaks usually occur. So this is a plot. This just shows what we call the biodiversity of the microbiome. So this is all the bugs uh, present uh, in the bowel. And when we looked at the three different time points, what we see is that biodiversity decreases. So it goes from pre-op on the right-hand side, it gets less intra-op. That's probably because we give them bowel prep and flush the colon out, and then drops off again more significantly 
in the post-operative period. And that may be related to the antibiotics that were given at the time of surgery. So we see this shrinkage in the biodiversity, but then what we see are certain bacterial species beginning to flourish. And two of the most important ones, particularly for an astomotic leak, is Pseudomonas and Enterococcus. And we see how these become much, much more abundant in the post-operative period. And this is fresh off the press. I've only had this for, for a couple of weeks. But we, we looked at all the different hospitals that took part uh, in our study. And what we found was, on the right-hand side is the Pseudomonas, on the left-hand side is the Enterococcus. And you see massive variation in the prevalence of these drugs between different hospitals. And it's going to be fascinating to look at the leak rates in these hospitals and compare them to the bugs that we are uh, isolating. And it suggests that some hospitals are doing things very differently, altering the microbiome of their patients as compared to others. So a fascinating uh, area to, to watch. Fluorescent surgery with ICG has lots and lots of applications. I talked about it for leak, but it's very, very useful in, for example, pouch surgery. So one of the difficulties in making a pouch is getting enough length to get the pouch down onto the anal canal. And occasionally you have to divide certain blood vessels to get that length. And it is so useful to be able to check the blood supply of the pouch before doing the anastomosis. And similarly, colostomies, any stoma, particularly colostomies though, many of them have to go back and be revised. So you pull the colostomy up and it looks dusky, it goes black, and we end up having to take the patient back. Checking the blood flow to the colostomy at the time of operation may just uh, well prevent that from uh, happening. I've talked about blood supply to the anastomosis. I've talked about bugs inside the bowel. And we turned our attention to, well, is there anything we can do, actually, to prevent the leak uh, occurring? And what caught our attention was the, what they call regenerative cells that reside in this big fatty tissue that's inside all our abdomens, some more than others. But um, these regenerative cells uh, help the healing process in the peritoneal cavity. It's sometimes referred to as the abdominal policeman. So the concept was, at the beginning of the operation, could we take this fatty tissue, harvest the regenerative cells, put them in a gel, and then put it around the anastomosis to try and encourage healing and prevent leak. And to do this uh, all within the time frame uh, of an operation. So we spent quite a lot of time, and I mean years really, and this is a PhD for somebody, looking at what the cells actually composed of and their healing properties. So what sort of growth factors did they produce? How did they encourage uh, vascularization of uh, the tissues? And just recently, one of our uh, PhD students has undertaken what is quite a big uh, animal study. So this is a mouse. Um, the top uh, right uh, is the omentum of a mouse. There isn't much of it, but he was able to take that, extract the cells, put them in some gel, then make an anastomosis, and then put the gel and cells around the anastomosis. And he did it in a randomized sort of uh, fashion so that he could compare the different groups. And what he found was there was a difference in the leak rate if you had the cells and gel compared to not having the cells and gel. But it didn't, it was around 9%, but that wasn't statistically significant. But interestingly, if you had the gel around the anastomosis, what tended to happen was if it did leak, it was confined as an abscess. Whereas if you didn't have the gel, what the animals developed was fecal and peritonitis. And there's a big difference in the morbidity and the mortality. So I think there is something in this story. I've talked about using fluorescence, 
for anastomoses. We use fluorescent surgery now for uh, lots of different things. Uh, in this example, we explored another drug. It was called 5-ALA, and it's taken up specifically by cancer cells. And they turn it into a molecule that when you shine blue light on it, it fluoresces pink. And so we thought this might be a nice way of helping us do cancer surgery. It's used in, in brain. It's used in glioblastoma in the brain. So it was a translation from one disease um, to another. And we had some moderate success with it, but it, it, it wasn't great. So we, we, we tried something else. We tried this drug called EMI-137. EMI stands for Edinburgh Molecular Imaging. And it binds to a receptor on colorectal cancer cells. And again, we tested it in, I think it was around 30 patients. Um, and we didn't get the results that we uh, uh, anticipated. And the reason for that, when we looked at the histology, when we took the cancers out and looked at the histology, the receptor was there, so the drug should be binding to it. But clearly the drug wasn't getting into the tumour. So we thought, if there isn't anything on the market that we can use for cancer surgery, well, why don't we try and make something ourselves? So what we set about doing was making this silica nanoparticle. It's a silica particle. It's about 90 nanometers in size. And inside it, we put a photosensitizer. And what a photosensitizer is, if you shine light on it, it excites it. And as it decays back to the the normal state, it emits electrons which can cause free radicals and cause uh, cell death. So we also targeted it, so we put this mini antibody on it against CEA. Now CEA is expressed in a lot of colorectal cancer uh, tissues. So we had a particle with a, a drug in it uh, that we could also target. And we did some studies in the laboratory and it seemed to work. So we took it into uh, a mouse model. So on the right here, we see uh, our mouse that's been injected with tumor cells in the flank. And you let the tumor cells grow up into what we call a, a xenograft. And then we can inject this particle into our, uh, into our mice. And you can see from these images how it localizes. It's very, very bright in the area of the tumor, but not anywhere else suggesting that our targeting mechanism is, is really working. And when we shine the light, because it's got a photosensitizer in it, when we shine the light in the bottom right picture here, the black, green, and blue are controls, and the tumors in those animals continue to grow, whereas the red is our active treatment. And you can see by shining the light, it actually keeps the tumor at bay. It, it kills it and stops it growing. And we can see that reflected in the histology. So we see the cell death when we look at it under the microscope, but we don't see the cell death when we look at our control animals. And we thought about where can we uh, apply this? And one of our other big unmet needs in colorectal cancer is, is peritoneal carcinomatosis. Now this affects around 6% of our patients at, at diagnosis, but around 30-40% of patients will have this disease um, at the time of death. And peritoneal carcinomatosis just means widespread dissemination of cancer cells around the whole of the uh, peritoneal cavity. And as such, it, it's not curable. So chemotherapy really doesn't work. Radiotherapy isn't uh, applicable. The average lifespan survival of patients with this disease is, is around six to, six to eight months. So we really needed uh, a new strategy for this. So we created our, in the laboratory, we created our own model, our own rat model of uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis. You can see that up there on the left, these nodules of tumor representing peritoneal disease. We worked with some engineers, actually, they were from the University of Texas. And they were able to make us these tiny little implantable uh, LEDs. Remember, we need light to activate the photosensitizer. And we could implant these into animals. And it was wireless, so it was powered 
by radio frequency induction. So the same mechanism as you put your iPhone on a pad to induct charge to it, it's the same. And here's our mice. Um, they've got tumors in their flanks, and we've embedded these little uh, lights, uh, implantable wireless LEDs under them, and they're quite happy uh, running around. So we implant the uh, device, give the photosensitizer, and then we allow them to survive, and we uh, monitor the growth of the tumor. And on the right-hand side here, you can see the blue and red ones are control groups, and the black one is our active group. Those are the patients with the implant in and turned on. And we're able to control, again, tumor growth in an animal with, with this system. Turning track now a little bit, some of the other uh, work we do is more around trying to make surgery safer, or put another way, reducing the complications of surgery. Because again, we're not very good. We haven't made great inroads into that over the past few decades. So anyone coming uh, for a major operation is probably looking at a 30 to 50% chance of having a complication, which isn't particularly um, comforting, I wouldn't imagine. Most of those will be minor and can be sorted out, but some of them will be serious and they will have long-term consequences. So we started looking at remote patient monitoring. So this was a study one of our, our, our trainees undertook where she was patching patients uh, in hospital after their surgery. And the reason she thought this would be a good idea was at the moment we do our observations intermittently, perhaps once every four hours. And between this four hour period, a patient can deteriorate. And if you don't have real time continuous monitoring by, for example, uh, a patch, then you can miss that patient deteriorating. And we know the sooner you intervene in deteriorating patients, the better the chance of having a good outcome. So this was a small feasibility study. It wasn't power to show a, a definite result, but we saw some interesting trends. We saw that patients with the monitor got antibiotics quicker if they became unwell. We saw that they stayed slightly less longer in hospital. And we saw that the chance of them coming back to hospital within 30 days was also reduced. Using the same remote monitoring, um, we're continuing the theme, but this time looking at the preoperative setting. So looking at patient fitness before their operation. So around 80%, most of the morbidity or complications from surgery actually is only experienced by a small percentage, 12.5% of those who have it. So there's a very discreet, identifiable cohort of patients who will suffer from a complication. Now, to try and tease out who that might be, we currently use something called CPEC testing, which stands for cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And patients are invited up, they come up to the hospital, they sit on an exercise bike, and they have to pedal away for 15 minutes or so until they're um, exhausted. But there's a problem with that. Well, there's several problems with it, but around 10% of patients can't manage the CPEC. And you can understand that. If you're elderly, if you're frail, you're not going to be able to cope with this rigorous test. So we thought, is there a better way of doing it? Can we put a patch on people, allow them to go home, and we'll monitor them in their home, doing their normal daily uh, activities? And using through the same system, we can send them questionnaires. So we'd end up with a very rich uh, data set. And you can imagine if you've got a, uh, an 80-year-old lady who comes to your clinic, if you can see her at home buzzing around, going to bingo and everything, or whether she just sat in a chair all day, that might be very important to help surgical decision making. So the patients come up, they do their CPEC or otherwise, if, depending if they're fit enough, and we place a, a little patch on them. It links to a phone and off they go. And the phone sends all their data up to the cloud, which can be seen uh, by the clinician. 
And so we're running this study at the moment. Uh, it's supported by the Leeds Hospital Charity. And we've got about 50, 50 patients in. But patients are really, really keen on this. Um, we have very few patients who say they, they don't want to be part of this study. And we've taken this a, a little bit further because there, there is another device that actually you don't even need to wear a patch for. And it works on this principle of photophotosmography. And essentially what that is, you shine a light at the skin and the light that bounces back depends on the blood flow in the capillaries. So the signal you get back is different from the signal that uh, you shine on the skin. And here's uh, Melissa, she's working on this with us. And all she has to do is hold an iPhone or uh, Android phone to her face and it will capture her, how she's breathing, her blood pressure, her respiratory rate, uh, oxygenation. So this might be uh, a, a really good technology. But is it a good technology or is it just another gadget? And so we did this healthy volunteer study a small number of, uh, of patients, uh, not patients, normal um, people, 27, different ages, different, different ethnicities, different skin colorations. And we showed that um, our device, the vast mind, was essentially as good as the gold standard. The gold standard are the usual observations that we take in hospital for heart rate, oxygen saturation, or respiratory rate. Perhaps not so good, the blood pressure was the only one um, that was slightly out. But it's certainly uh, very promising. One of our other big issues for anyone who's had uh, bowel surgery is post-operative ileus. So this is where the bowel goes to sleep if you handle it uh, at all. And that can be very variable from patient to patient. Some people get very little ileus, some people the ileus can go on for uh, seven to 10 days. And if you're unfortunate enough to suffer ileus, you get a bloated abdomen, it compresses your chest so you can't breathe properly, you're more prone to chest infections, it's uncomfortable, you're confined in bed, you're not walking, therefore you're prone to getting clots in the legs. You can see how it all spirals out of control just because of this problem with the bowel not working. Now, the control of, uh, control of bowel motility is very complex, but two of the things that influence it are, are one, the hormones within the bowel itself, but also the nerves coming from your brain are very important in determining uh, how the bowel works. And there was some growing evidence that if you stimulate one of these nerves, it's called the vagus nerve, you could actually increase bowel activity. And this device is on the market, is CE marked, and it's used for uh, cluster migraine headaches. So we were interested whether we could use this um, to try and increase bowel motility post-operatively. And in conjunction with this, we needed some way of measuring how the bowel was working. So we worked with a company who had an electronic stethoscope. So this allows you to actually digitally hear bowel sounds and we correlated those with the motility of the bowel so we could do ultrasound, actually look at how the bowel was moving and then correlate it to this digital uh, signature. This was a feasibility study, so a smallish study around 100 patients. It's very complicated, but essentially we were stimulating the nerve in different ways, some before the operation, some after the operation, uh, uh, some on both. And what we found is, again, uh, the compliance of this was very, very good. So patients found it an easy uh, intervention to use. There were very little uh, complications or side effects. Because it was a feasibility study, we didn't actually see uh, any big differences between the groups. But what we do know, if we want to take this into a bigger study now, is it's going to be quite easy for us uh, to recruit patients to it. So that brings me on to what I think is the, the last topic uh, that we're working on, and that's post-operative pain. So anyone who has an operation will be, be able to relate to this. And the figures are really quite, um, uh, quite shocking, actually, when you look at them. So the perioperative quality improvement program, that's a, a national 
registry and, and, and audit that collects data on patients who've had operations. And in 2017-18, they did a report uh, on pain after surgery. And they found that 48% of patients suffer moderate pain and 19% of patients suffer, suffer severe pain. Now, you'd like to think in, the, in this day and age we could actually do an operation and actually keep people pain-free. And keeping them pain-free is absolutely key because if you're not pain-free, again, you're not going to cough. You're not going to get out of bed. You're not going to walk. So controlling pain, again, is one of those pinch areas that we've got to try and do something about. Now, traditional uh, post-operative pain relies predominantly on, on what we call opioids, morphine-like uh, drugs. And they're, they're good against pain. They will stop pain, but they have complications. So they will slow your breathing. They will slow your heart rate. They will slow the bowel from working. They might make you confused. They will reduce your mobility again, keeping you in bed, which isn't a good thing after an operation. So we were kind of thinking around this and thinking, surely there must be a better way than what we're doing at the moment. What we need is a post-operative pain relief that isn't opioid. It's not opioid-based, so we're not going to get these complications. And ideally, what we want to do is just give it once. And then it has a slow release, a prolonged uh, duration of action. So you're not dependent when you're in the bed, get pain, having to buzz, wait for the busy nurse to come to give you uh, whatever pain relief uh, that you need. And ideally, you want to apply it immediately after you've done the operation. So it's got the maximum time uh, to work. And so we thought about strategies that perhaps we could get post-operative pain for maybe a minimum uh, of five days after the operation. So the idea is we do keyhole surgery. And where we do a resection, take the bowel out, it leaves this raw area. And so we, could we put a, a painkiller on that area and hold it in place with a special spray gel? We'd spell a, a spray a gel. And so with our chemistry colleagues, we made these things called vesicles. These are really sort of lipid bubbles. But inside the lipid bubble, you can put, put your drug. And what's nice about these bubbles is you can alter the amount of lipid and polymer so there's two elements, there's a lipid and polymer that go into this bubble. And by altering the ratio, you can tune the release. You can make them release the drug uh, quicker or slower. So we perfected a method for making these bubbles, and then we looked at all these uh, release profiles. So you can see on the black line on this uh, graph on the left, you can see the release going up. And it goes up quickly to a plateau, and that's the bubble that has all lipid. There's no polymer in it. Whereas if you go down to the purple line, that's got mainly polymer and less lipid in it. And so the release is much slower. So we're currently, this is an experiment that is ongoing at the moment, where we're testing it in mice. So we do a little opening, a laparotomy uh, on the mouse. We then do an abrasion, so just scratch the inside of the peritoneum on, on the mice, and then we either apply our, uh, our bubble with, an, uh, with a uh, painkiller with gel on it, or we don't, so we have a control group uh, as well. There's a third control group, which is we just open the animal up and close it. We don't do any abrading at all. And the, experiment, the results are, are beginning to look uh, really quite promising for us. So you'll see the red line uh, here. These are animals who we've opened up and we've scratched them and then closed it up. And they get a lot of pain, as you can imagine. You can see the, the green and the black lines are the animals we just make an opening and close them. We don't do any scratching at all. And then in between these two, the purple and blue, are those are the animals we put our pain-killing bubbles and gel on. And so what we're seeing is instead of very high pain levels, that red one, it's dropping them down. So it's dropping them down more towards those animals who've had a very minimal uh, open and closed operation. 
So we're excited about that going forwards, and we'll, we'll see where it leads us. So I hope I've been able to give you uh, a very high-level overview of some of the innovation areas uh, that we're interested in and working on. There's no doubt that technology is, is the main driving force in pushing healthcare uh, improvement forwards, and it will uh, continue to be. There are many exciting uh, opportunities and areas to working, but the key to all this is, is team working. You've got to bring the people with the right knowledge and, and experience together into these multidisciplinary teams. That's the only way you're going to tackle uh, these uh, complicated problems. But the most important thing is that we don't get carried away with technology and the science for the sake of it. We've always got to have a reality check and say, is what we're doing, do we actually need it? Is it going to be of any real clinical benefit? And this is where working with patients and organisations like uh, yourselves is so important. We need um, groups like yourselves to tell us what it is that, that are the crucial things um, uh, that are annoying you, and that can be made better, and then we can focus our efforts uh, onto those areas. Many thanks for listening. Thank you, David. That was, uh, I think, an absolutely fantastic uh, Brian Brook lecture. I think Brian Brook would have recognised almost all of the problems you described from his practice, but I suspect he would have recognised almost none of the solutions, uh, which really were a, a demonstration of a technical tour de force. Um, we're not going to have time, I think, for questions right now, but we hope you'll be able to join us later for the panel discussion. And so if you do have questions, please can you save them for David. Um, in the meantime, before we head off to the workshops, it's my pleasure and honour uh, to award you the Brian Brook Lecture uh, medal 2023. Thank David, you. thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good. Thanks, Megan. Oh, don't get it scratched. No, beautiful. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you.